Hello everyone. It is time for new mystery stories. So please join me in my study. Relax. We have a nice fire in the fireplace. And let me take you around the world and through time with three different stories for tonight. First, I will tell you about Area 51, how this space, this facility of the US Air Force in Nevada, rose to fame at the beginning among UFO enthusiasts and later in popular culture and became linked to a lot of conspiracy theories. Why it happened, how, and we will take a look at what there is to it. Then I will tell you about Chaco Canyon in New Mexico, a large collection of pre-Columbian ruins built by the ancient Puebloans more than a thousand years ago. And even though there are many clues, the exact role, the exact functions of this site remain mysterious. And finally, we will jump even farther back in time and discuss the uh, hypothesis, the theory of the Toba catastrophe, the possible eruption of a supervolcano around 70,000 to 75,000 years ago that would have plunged Earth into a volcanic winter for several years and affected the climate for several centuries. We will see why this theory exists and what a supervolcano is like. You can navigate between the stories with the timestamps on your screen and in the pinned comment under the video, where you will also find links to Patreon. You are very welcome to join my Patreon if you wish to access the perks on my Patreon page. Support the channel and keep it free of ad breaks and also links to Spotify, Apple Music, and other audio streaming services if you prefer to listen to my stories there. The stories are posted to these audio platforms without sound effects, during or after my talk, in case you prefer them this way. But for now, let's begin our journey, and our starting point is in Nevada, in the middle of the desert. I am sure you have already heard of Area 51, but Area 51 is not its official name, it is a common name for an US Air Force facility that is officially called Homey Airport, or sometimes Groom Lake. The closest large city to the base is Las Vegas, 80 miles to the southeast. But contrary to what one may suppose, the fame of Area 51 is rather recent in popular culture, about 30 years old only. How did it all begin? Because the base operated long before it became famous. An airfield was built on this site in 1942, but that was a very basic airfield. The base really started to exist in the 1950s, when it was chosen by the US Air Force to establish a test facility for the development of a particular aircraft, the Lockheed U-2. We will come back to that. For about 30 years, the base operated and hardly anyone talked about it in the media. It had no presence in popular culture at all. It was and it still is remote, so only military personnel, government officials and uh, immediate neighbors ever thought or talked about it. 
The closest inhabited area is a small town called Rachel, population 48, according to the last census. From the 1950s to the 70s, there were alleged sightings of strange aerial phenomena, UFOs maybe, around the facility. And so a few UFO hunters may have heard of it. But at the time, since the 1950s, there had been a huge rise in the number of alleged sightings of flying objects all across the United States and in other parts of the world too. So this particular facility, this base, was just one site among many, and there was nothing sufficient to make it really famous. If you had asked average Americans at the time, in the 60s for example, about UFO activity, they could have mentioned the Roswell incident that had happened in 1947 in New Mexico and had risen to fame, but certainly not Area 51. By the way, it is unclear how the facility got this popular name of Area 51. It could be because there is a grid in this area made by the Atomic Energy Commission with different areas that were given a number. And even though the facility itself is not an atomic facility, it is adjacent to this grid. So maybe the name stayed, or it was colloquially given the number 51 because it is adjacent to Area 15. But as I said before, Area 51 is not the official name. The status of Area 51 in popular culture started to change only in the 1980s. The interest in UFOs had had a spike in the 1950s, reflected in many movies at the time, with flying saucers and a taste for science fiction. But then it had receded until the late 1970s and the early 80s, when this interest woke up. Successful books commercially talked about UFO sightings or alleged contacts with aliens, especially a 1980 book about Roswell. At the time, the Roswell incident had been almost forgotten, and this book sparked interest again in it. There were also movies and TV shows in the late 70s and early 80s that helped renew interest in the population, interest in space and extraterrestrials. For example, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, E.T., even the Star Wars movies, Alien, V, it is hard to tell exactly if these media productions reflected or impulsed popular interest, probably both, but in any case, ufologist circles grew strongly in the 1980s. Many people were drawn again to them, out of curiosity of interest. It was still a rather underground movement, it probably still is today, but it grew a lot. Another aspect of this new wave of interest in UFOs since the 1980s, and in this it was different from the previous one in the 50s, was that in the meantime the confidence in uh, the transparency and uh, maybe even the honesty of the government had fallen, at least in a subset of the population. So it came with suspicion against the government, the belief, or at least a questioning, about the possibility that the government withheld information that should not be classified, manipulated, spied on citizens, or even acted knowingly against the population. This is another debate, but obviously society had changed since the 1950s 
was it due to decades of Cold War, to a rise in individualism, the Vietnam War, the Watergate, or other causes? It is hard to tell, but defiance towards the government, a loss of trust, had happened since the 50s. And I think it is fair to say that this trend has not diminished. Maybe it has strengthened since the 80s. I'm telling you this because this is certainly important to understand how the image of Area 51 in popular culture and all the conspiracy theories that exist around it could uh, appear. It is hard for a government or the military to counter claims that they hide things, because of course they do. Secrecy is part of military research, of diplomacy, of intelligence. Certain archives are not accessible to the public, not immediately. There are even legal frames and rules for that. So is it possible to be sure that a government is perfectly law-abiding and does not cross lines or retain information using this secrecy? No. There are examples of governments hiding experiments or lying. So it is probably healthy to always have a degree of doubt. But the point here, to return to Area 51, is that since the 1980s, this loss of trust in governments had taken bigger proportions. And over time, it has become a theme, almost a cliché, in popular culture at this point. We are so used to see this kind of plot device in movies or TV shows that we take them almost as a given. In any political thriller, the government is either infiltrated, controlled by other forces, acting against people, or, at the very least, hiding things. Obviously, there's a frontier between entertainment and what people really believe, but I think we can agree that conspiracy theories involving authorities are much more prevalent than they used to be. A majority of people probably don't actually believe them, or they just play with these ideas in the back of their mind. But instead of being a very underground theme, like it used to be, conspiracy theories that involved authorities, governments, military, are now something very visible. So I'm telling you all this because without conspiracy theories, Area 51 would not be famous. All the claims about it refer to different conspiracies or at least the dissimulation of information by authorities. The claims are not limited to supposed alien contact and technology, even though this is the most frequent angle when Area 51 is mentioned in the media. We will look at these claims in a minute. But to conclude on the rise to fame of Area 51, I was telling you that 40 years ago it was not a household name yet. But along the 1980s, the site drew more and more interest in circles of UFO enthusiasts and in certain groups interested in conspiracy theories until a local radio interview in 1989 in which one of their representatives said that Area 51 was actually a site to study and reverse engineer alien technology. This statement had circulated for years, but it was the first time it was said in mainstream media, rather than in fanzines or confidential meetings between aficionados. That was only 33 years ago. But after that, things went very fast. A few years later, the entertainment industry had already put its hands on the idea. So it appeared in uh, The X-Files, the TV show, or the movie Independence Day, which was seen by tens, even hundreds of millions of people 
around the world. And in both cases, they presented the existence of alien artifacts and cover-ups by the military at Area 51 as something that had been going on for a long time. So suddenly, in the 1990s, everyone became aware that Area 51 existed, that it was not a secret base, but a base where secret things took place, and there were plenty of elements that could spark curiosity, interest in it. It was in a remote, desertic area. It had underground facilities. There had been unexplained sightings for decades around the base, and no shortage of exciting claims. These claims include the storage and study of crashed alien spacecrafts, as I said before. Probably the thing most people think about immediately when Area 51 is mentioned. But there are other claims, including that it would be a place of meetings or joint undertakings between the US Air Force and the extraterrestrials, that exotic high-tech weapons would be developed there, that it would be a center for the study of weather control, or even more impressive, the development of time travel and teleportation technology. So, what is behind these alleged activities? Possibly human activity for some of them, because there is no doubt that secret or at least confidential development on military technology took place at Area 51. The US Air Force admitted it, and it is a possible explanation for UFO sightings around or near the base. When it was established in the 50s, its purpose was the development of a strategic reconnaissance aircraft, the Lockheed U-2. Secrecy around this program was extreme at the time, and Area 51 was chosen as a test site because it was more remote and easier to secure than other facilities of Lockheed, the plane manufacturer or the US Air Force. The presence of a dry lake was also an advantage to build a flat and long runway. Interestingly, the U-2 was a reconnaissance aircraft, that is to say, a spy plane, designed to collect images of the ground or intercept communications while remaining very discreet. These planes were developed after the Second World War, in the context of the Cold War. Of course, there were reconnaissance flights before, including in the First World War. The first military planes used over battlefields were actually used for reconnaissance rather than direct fight. But during and after the Second World War, they became increasingly technological and specifically designed for this purpose. Typically, they fly very high to avoid detection. The Lockheed U-2 was designed to fly at 21,000 meters, or 70,000 feet. This is twice the altitude of a typical commercial flight. As the Cold War was now in place, the United States needed a new advanced reconnaissance aircraft. And Lockheed proposed this program, which was approved in 1954, and test flights began in 1955. Since then, the U-2 had a, a long career. It was technically upgraded several times, and it is still in use. At first, the program was top secret, but it soon became well known in military circles when the first aircrafts were put in operations, and then in the public opinion at large, especially from 1960, because one U-2 was shot down 
above the USSR. And its pilot, Gary Powers, was captured alive and tried for spying in the Soviet Union. Then he was put in jail, where he spent almost two years until he was exchanged in Berlin and came back to the West. We cannot exactly know how many of these reconnaissance aircrafts were shot down or captured on each side during the Cold War. Maybe other cases were never made public because the USA and the USSR did everything they could to spy on each other. Everyone knew it, and the choice to go public when spies were captured, to deliberately create an incident and feign outrage, was always a choice. Both sides did it when they thought it served their interests at the time. So maybe there were more incidents that we never heard of. But at least another U-2 was shot down in 1962, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. But returning to Area 51, the plane was tested there. And the program was secret. So obviously the US Air Force was not going to acknowledge that they were testing a secret aircraft when the aircraft was seen from the ground or by another plane, flying surprisingly fast or at completely unusual altitudes. For decades, the official reply, when there was one, spoke of atmospheric phenomena, which is not a very credible explanation for an unknown flying object that can go up and down and accelerate or decelerate in flight. There are no natural phenomena looking like that. So of course it did nothing to discourage UFO hunters. And it didn't stop with the U-2. A few years later, in the early 60s, another project of reconnaissance aircraft, the Lockheed A-12, was tested at Area 51. It was intended as a successor to the U-2, a successor that would have a reduced radar cross-section, that is to say, one harder to detect by radars, because its radar signature would be more discreet. Even more than the U-2, it looked futuristic at the time, unlike any other jet plane and it was tested at Area 51 for several years. But ultimately this model was retired by the end of the 60s and was survived by the U-2 that it intended to replace initially. This program, the A-12, was acknowledged 30 years later, in the 1990s, just when the fame of Area 51 was on the rise. Another program of the 60s that included attempts to turn reconnaissance jets into drones to eliminate the risk of capture of a pilot, like what had happened with Gary Powers, was the D-21, which ultimately, after different versions and uh, missions in real conditions, like above China, was also retired earlier than hoped. This one became public in the 70s. So, as you see from the beginning, there was no shortage of secret aircrafts, prototypes or test crafts that took off and landed at Area 51. And when you have these futuristic aircrafts flying, sometimes far from their base, trying to be as discreet as possible, which means avoiding the sending of waves, that would reveal their presence, but also means they could fly near other planes without detecting them sometimes. Plus, the Air Force that doesn't want or cannot acknowledge them, so stays silent or give explanations that are not very credible. 
and you have fertile ground for plenty of UFO sightings and suspicions that remain unanswered. But the activity of Area 51 did not stop there. As the base was gaining importance and more facilities were built on the site, it also doubled, starting in the late 60s, as a place where foreign technology was studied. For decades, and maybe it is still the case today, Area 51 became a place to store and examine foreign aircraft. And not just aircraft, missiles or radar systems too, mainly from the Soviet Union. The idea was not just to look for designs or inventions that could be useful, but to test how fighter jets or bombers would fare against their American counterparts. So that involved fighting simulations and tests. So here again, a lot of flights around the base, and sometimes with aircraft that were never seen in American skies. The last known program to have been developed and publicly acknowledged at Area 51 is the F-117, not a reconnaissance aircraft, but rather one designed for surface attack, and also a stealth aircraft, that is to say profiled and equipped with technologies that avoid detection, concretely by reducing the reflection or emissions of waves, be they visible light, infrared, waves on the radio frequency spectrum, audio waves. The F-117 became famous for being the first aircraft to be designed around stealth technology, and it also had a very futuristic look, with sharp angles that looked very different from what people associated with planes, including military fighters. Actually, the design of spacecrafts in sci-fi shows or movies of the past three decades that try to have a realistic look, including shows like The Expanse or Battlestar Galactica, their designs probably owe a lot to the lines of the F-117. But the first prototypes with this kind of sharp profile were actually from the late 70s, more than 40 years ago. So it is another flying object that could have looked out of place or even alien to people in the 1980s. The F-117 is now retired but operations went on, on other programs, and maybe more than ever at this point today, since the exclusionary area around the facility was expanded in the 1990s. So, if we accept the premise that the US Air Force or the US government have put their hands on some alien technology, which is a big assumption, but Let's take it as a hypothesis for a moment. Would it make sense to study it at Area 51? Technically, maybe, probably, the base has specialized in dissecting foreign technology, so there would be an expertise there. What sounds maybe less credible is that the US Air Force would keep their alien technology just where everyone expects to find it. If the idea is to be able to conduct research secretly, it may not be ideal to do it at a base that is constantly surrounded by curious eyes that are looking for it, even though it is very defended, everything is classified, and alien enthusiasts are kept out of the exclusionary area. I guess if I were the Air Force, I would keep Area 51 as a decoy and store my alien technology somewhere else. Actually, if we accept for a second that the US government owns alien technology, a conspiracy theory I would be more inclined to give credit to is that Area 51 was entirely fabricated 
as a decoy, with just enough denegations and uh, media content to uh, turn it into a pop culture phenomenon, to uh, attract the crowd's attention so that they could discreetly store and study it somewhere else. But this being said, I am not aware of any proof, any tangible proof, that the US military, or the military of any country for that matter, has ever seized extraterrestrial technology. There is no shortage of people claiming it, but where are the proofs that could make it more than exciting speculation? Other claims made about Area 51 fall in the same category. It would be a place for meetings or communication with aliens, if it were the case, it would be weird to also use the site for testing aircraft. There is no logical connection between the two. And the aircraft models that were developed at Area 51, from the 1950s with the U-2 to the 80s with the F-117, were always technically advanced, possibly the most advanced in the world, when they first appeared. But their capabilities, the engines, the speed, the stealth technology, the materials, they all look very explainable when we look back. They did not require a technological jump that only alien technology could have brought. The proof is that about at the same time, or only a few years later, other countries could make similar aircraft or at least understand their technology. There are yet other claims about Area 51, but I have failed to find a substance to it. That Area 51 would be a center for the research of climate control, time travel, or teleportation. Why not, but why this particular site? It doesn't seem there ever were tangible elements that linked Area 51 to this. At least UFOs are somewhat credible, because there were flying objects above the base, and to most they were unidentifiable, so technically there were UFOs at Area 51, but they may be man-made rather than extraterrestrial. The other claims sound more like bonus theories that were attached to the place because it already had a reputation for secrecy and advanced technologies. And as we have seen, this reputation for secrecy was well deserved. It is also possible that other aircrafts were developed there and abandoned or they exist and we have not heard of them yet. Another time, I will tell you about Aurora, which was a rumored aircraft that some people suspected the US were developing in the mid-80s. Another reconnaissance aircraft, with a revolutionary profile and capabilities. It would have been, based on the rumors, hypersonic, able to fly at Mach 5, five times sound speed. In the 90s, sighting claims in the UK and in the US were attributed to this Aurora program. But 25 years later, we have never seen it acknowledged or in operation, and it is now widely regarded as a myth based on leaks that could have been related to another program. But it is possible, likely even, that prototypes that are still unknown to most people or improved versions of existing aircrafts have existed and still exist at Area 51. So even though I could not give credit to these various conspiracy theories, I think it is fair to assume that there are secret activities going on there and they won't be revealed before decades, if ever. For our second story, we're going to stay in the United States, but move a little bit east, to New Mexico, and explore Chaco Canyon. 
What are the mysteries there? Chaco Canyon is a quite inhospitable place. Very hot in summer days, but freezing cold during winter nights. Arid, far from forests or large expanses of cultivable land. And yet, it is there that more than a thousand years ago, people from the ancestral Puebloan culture built a large complex that was obviously not just utilitarian. They had to quarry and transport sandstone blocks on great distances. They erected high buildings, some with four stories and hundreds of rooms. They brought timber from faraway forests, and on a large area, they modeled the land and built on it with a layout that was all but random. Buildings were aligned to capture the solar and lunar cycles. They formed geometrical patterns that took into account cardinal directions. And on a broader scale, the central canyon was a connection point to uh, many villages, pueblos, dozens of them, spread on a large area through an enigmatic web of road systems. Until the 19th century, the ruins of Chaco Canyon were the largest buildings in the United States, even though they were already centuries old and had long been abandoned. This invites to reconsider the belief that large stone architecture was mainly to be found in Mesoamerica or in the Andes in pre-Columbian times. No, Chaco Canyon is a massive site, and it is far from Mexico or Peru. So, who were the builders? Why did they create this site over several generations? What did it mean to them? What was its function or its functions? This remains an open question and that's the core of the mystery. But there are ways to approach and better understand the mystery of Chaco Canyon. First of all, what does the Chaco Canyon site look like and how vast is it? The canyon itself is at the center of what is now a large American national park, the Chaco Culture National Historical Park. In the canyon, there are several large complexes. The most famous and largest of them is called Pueblo Bonito, and it consists of hundreds of rooms that are all connected and ordered in a half circle. These structures, these complexes, are like a big palace or an entire village. They are called great houses. And there are several more great houses other than Pueblo Bonito. Smaller, but each with dozens of rooms. And these different great houses have been dated from different periods. But because there are also these roads that I mentioned before and other sites outside the canyon that were connected to it, we have to consider a larger scale. The canyon lies within a basin, the San Juan Basin, that covers 7,500 square miles and extends beyond New Mexico to the southwest of Colorado and parts of Utah and Arizona. Long ago, this was the heart of ancestral Puebloan culture. I told you about them already in another story about Cliff Palace, better known as Mesa Verde in Colorado. I'll put a link in the description so you can refer to it if you want to know more about the emergence and migrations of Puebloans. Their culture in Chaco emerged in population of basket makers. Basket maker is the name of a pre-Puebloan culture 
that began in this region, or at least archaeologists found traces of it, more than 3,000 years ago. It evolved into a distinct culture, with enough traits in their architecture, their crafts, their art, to be considered a new culture. And this evolution happened around the 8th century of our era, 12 to 1300 years ago. Archaeologists have distinguished from this point on different eras in Puebloan culture. They have been given numbers, one, two, three, each one corresponding to new developments and migrations too. Chaco Canyon was built during the first three eras and in several stages. It seems that at the time the region was less hostile than today in terms of climate. It would have been cooler and wetter. And in the 9th century, the population in and around the canyon would have grown a lot. The first great houses would have been built at this time and in the following decades in several stages. For example, Pueblo Bonito would have been started in the 10th century AD with the first section of 50 rooms. Traces of a system to process and trade turquoise in the canyon between different of these settlements of these great houses were found which indicates that they had connections. Maybe these settlements all had different leaders or there was a hierarchy between them. This is unknown. But in the two following centuries, Chaco Canyon prospered and the building activity was quite intense. Until the 12th century, around 1140 AD, at this point, it seems the different communities started to lose population. By the end of the 12th century, the ancient Puebloans had gone. They had sealed many of their buildings with stone and abandoned them. We know they did not vanish at all. They just migrated to the south, the west, the east, and they left the region but traces of their presence after the abandonment of Chaco Canyon were found in various parts of the American Southwest. Later, in the 15th century, the San Juan Basin, where the canyon is located, was claimed by newcomers to the region, such as the Apache and Navajo. This is another thing I also told you about in the talk about Apache and Navajo mythological stories. You will also find the link in the description. These new inhabitants of the region knew the canyon and most probably were aware of the ruins that the ancestral Puebloans had left, but they didn't occupy them. So why did the Puebloans evacuate? One explanation might be because of warfare they had neighbors in the 12th century living on the Colorado Plateau. But there is little evidence of that. Their great houses in the canyon don't really show many signs of damage that could be attributed to a war, with only a few exceptions where signs of burning were found. They were also not built in defensive positions or with defensive structures like walls. So this explanation is not really satisfactory. Another one, maybe more important as a factor, is that an extreme drought began a few years before their evacuation. The conditions for agriculture were already not ideal, but they could have worsened a lot and deforestation would have forced them to go always farther to find wood. This could have made the canyon too inhospitable and forced them to leave. 
Maybe it was a combination of fighting and scarcity of resources, or other reasons that we can only imagine. Maybe political infighting, or a religious belief that they had to look for another land. But in any case, the site stopped being inhabited almost 900 years ago, and stayed completely frozen in time. It is only over the past two centuries that the history of ancient Puebloans has been studied methodically, and that the site has been rediscovered by the descendants of the builders and by archaeologists. It had been forgotten or become legendary because the Puebloans never built again on such a scale. Looking at how the complexes were built, they impress by their size hundreds of rooms. And these rooms were substantial in size, not small, with a tendency to place the ceilings higher and higher as decades passed and construction went on. But it is not only the size. A lot of planning was involved. Vast sections or entire wings were finished in a single stage. Each wet house had a central plaza, a semicircle, and individual houses that formed the complex, they were all stuck together, became higher and higher with the distance from the plaza. The first line facing the plaza was single-story rooms, and then houses went up like the steps of uh, stairs. Red houses also comprised circular spaces that were partially or entirely underground. These are called kivas, and these rooms, some large, others smaller, were used by Puebloans for various things. They had a religious or spiritual function to perform rites and gatherings, and also probably a political one. It could be the place where the communities gathered to debate or discuss topics of interest. They could also have been places where some people with a particular function in this society lived, their house. Kivers are found on all ancient Puebloan sites. And not only Puebloans, this kind of circular meeting place existed in various cultures of the American Southwest. Now, one thing that has called the attention of archaeologists since they began studying Chaco Canyon is how gigantic the site looks in comparison with the estimated population of ancient Puebloans who lived in this area. And their access to resources, especially food, Together with the roads that connect it, this is why it has been hypothesized that Chaco Canyon was not just a place of residence, but rather a unique site in Puebloan culture, with a particular significance. The alignment with the sun, the moon and constellations, the aesthetic, also are elements that indicate a lot of meaning was involved in this site. But why? What was the function of Chaco Canyon? It could have been a place where Puebloans gathered, some from afar, a kind of capital in a culture that did not work as a state in the sense that there was no central administration and a, a unique leader. It was decentralized but a sense of belonging to the same culture group could have motivated the creation of a place like this one. Another possibility, but it does not exclude the first one, is that Chaco Canyon had a trade significance. The web of roads, this would have made it the marketplace of ancient Puebloans. It would have had a, a limited fixed population and a larger fleeting population who travel to it. 
These explanations are utilitarian and they can make sense, but they don't really tell us why such symbolic care and planning was given, was invested into the site. The kind of alignments that exist at Chaco Canyon were possible only thanks to generations of astronomical observation. And there is more than simple alignments. The site includes a butte, that is to say one of these isolated hills with vertical sides and a flat top that are typical of desertic areas in the southwest. On this butte, a petroglyph called the Sun Dagger was discovered. It is made of two spirals, placed in such a way that a stain of sunlight, like a spear of light, filtered by slabs, illuminates it and indicates equinoxes and other recurring astronomical events. The material used is basic. But the arrangement of this light clock is uh, very elaborate, very ingenious, and reveals an impressive knowledge of astronomy. This is not something unique in pre-Columbian America. Other civilizations had an advanced astronomical knowledge, based on centuries or at least generations of observation but it shows how far the Puebloans had advanced in that field. When we take the sun dagger into account, and the alignments within and between great houses, their semicircular shape, their very deliberate aesthetic, it looks obvious that there was a deep intention, symbolical or spiritual or cosmological, that organized the whole site. To what ends? This is the core of the mystery. The Puebloans had no writing system, so there is no explicit document to work on, only hypotheses that can be made. Was it a kind of offering to gods? A way, maybe, of transposing an order that seemingly existed in the heavens to the earth? It is hard to tell, but an idea I find seducing could be that, in their view, the skies looked ordered with the same celestial bodies following cycles, the sun and the moon returning each day and following patterns that were predictable over the month and the years. In contrast, the earth was chaotic and unpredictable. It could be too dry or too hot. Death happened on it. Based on this, they could have elaborated a cosmology that made earth the realm of disorder, as opposed to the harmony and the eternal order of the heavens. Chaco Canyon could have been an attempt to transfer to our world the orderly nature of the heavens, to create a contact point where the perfection of the cosmos was reflected on Earth, a kind of center of the world, or at least of their world. Our third story begins on the other side of the world, on the island of Sumatra, in Indonesia. In the north of Sumatra, there is a large lake with an island in the middle. The lake measures up to 62 miles in length, 100 kilometers, and almost 20 miles in width. Nowadays it is a beautiful place with blue waters and green hills all around the lake. But this lake is special. It occupies the ancient caldera, the chimney, of a giant volcano. A volcano, Mount Toba, that was so large and powerful, it is called a supervolcano. We will see what it means. And 
This volcano is thought to have erupted around 70, 75,000 years ago. Volcanic eruptions are rather common, but this one was so powerful that it would have had consequences on the whole planet for several years, affecting life everywhere, including humankind. What happened? How do we know that it had an impact during uh, prehistory without any uh, testimony of it? And what is a supervolcano? This is what we are going to talk about. First of all, what is a supervolcano? As the name indicates, there are particularly large volcanoes, but also volcanoes that have extremely violent eruptions. As you may know, volcanic eruptions can take different forms. When magma from the planet's mantle can rise freely to the surface, they can be relatively smooth and look like an overflow of lava. But when the way out is blocked, a pool of hot magma may stay trapped in the Earth's crust. Pressure builds, and at some point, when the breaking point of the crust is reached, an explosive eruption happens. When the pool of magma that has accumulated is very large, the crust's breaking can send huge quantities of material above and around the volcano. A supervolcano is defined as one that has an eruption that projects a volume of deposits equal or greater than a thousand cubic kilometers, 240 cubic miles. There is an index to measure this, the Volcanic Explosivity Index, and its highest possible value is 8, and a supervolcano is defined as one that produced an eruption reaching 8 on this scale. These super eruptions are fairly rare. The most recent known volcanic explosion reaching an 8 on the index would have taken place 26,500 years ago in New Zealand at the Taupo volcano. The Taupo is now a sleep and its caldera has also turned into a lake in the center of New Zealand's North Island. The Toba eruption would have happened 50,000 years earlier and could have reached even greater proportions. To give you an idea, the largest volcanic eruption in recent history happened in 1815, the eruption of Mount Tambora, also in Indonesia. This eruption caused an entire year of cold in the northern hemisphere. This year has stayed in memories as the year without summer, and it had visible impacts on agriculture, the color of the sky, because there was ash in suspension in the atmosphere. It initiated research that determined that a single volcanic eruption could have consequences for the whole planet. The Toba eruption is estimated to have been 12 times greater than Mount Tambora. It would have deposited a layer of ashes of 15 centimeters, that's 6 inches, over the whole of South Asia. And ashes would have also reached everything from the Middle East to China. These numbers and the size of the eruption could be estimated by the examination of deposits left in remote areas by the eruption in various parts of the world. Their composition and dating among geological layers indicate where they come from and when they fell down. They suggest, based on modelization, that the Toba eruption could have been several times more powerful than the Taupo eruption itself. So, logically, this mega-eruption would have had a major impact on life. 
possibly several years of volcanic winter with still seasons but considerably colder than usual because ashes and dust in suspension in the atmosphere would have filtered sunlight and with the repercussions of these perturbations maybe even a much longer cooling period up to a thousand years the interesting thing here is that this event meets an observation that was made when studying the genetic heritage of men and various species of mammals. It seems that 70 to 50,000 years ago, the populations of humans, but also other species like African chimpanzees, cheetahs, tigers, suddenly shrank and brought them maybe even close to extinction. Only a few thousand individuals would have remained in the entire world at the peak of this crisis. And this is suspected because of genetics. It seems that today's humans are all descended from a small population of between a thousand to ten thousand couples, ten thousand breeding pairs, that would have lived around 70,000 years ago. This is not a certainty, but several clues in our common gene pool point to it. And the same is true for the other species I mentioned. This theory has a name. It is called the genetic bottleneck theory. At the very least, there is a lot of evidence that human population shrank on Earth at the time of the eruption. There is no certainty here either, and uh, let's bear in mind that the dating is not very precise. The date of the eruption is 70,000 to 75,000 years ago, with a margin of error of several thousand years. And we are probably not speaking of a giant explosion that would have killed most humans on Earth, but rather a sudden change in climate that would have cut their food supply with deforestation happening, their prey becoming rarer due to the collapse of food chains, and a decrease of the number of humans over several generations. In any case, Another element that points to the same hypothesis is that between 70,000 and 60,000 years ago, a major migration from Africa started and populated or repopulated other continents. It was not the only wave. It doesn't mean that humanity would have been wiped out everywhere else. But it could be another clue that maybe 70,000 years ago, the supervolcano that has now turned into a peaceful lake brought us to the brink of extinction. We have reached the end of our stories for tonight. I hope you like them. You can now let go and fall asleep. And I will be back soon with another story. In the meantime, sleep well. Sweet dreams. Au revoir.